exit, transfer to lift group B. For levels 20 and below, transfer to lift group C at level 21. For levels 20 and below, transfer to lift group C at level 21. in old Montreal, it's easy uh, to feel surrounded by the future, a future which we all know will be dominated, well, it already is, dominated by technology and uh, computers, and who better to talk about that than the Croakers? They are my guests in the second half hour after we hear a little music. There seems to be a distinct blurring occurring between the human form and the technological form. Would that be correct? Yeah, yeah. I think technology is about to leave the body behind, actually. That's what's going on in all the digital labs. They are really creating a new kind of species, which is the successor species to the human body. A six-game chess match pitting brains against circuitry is over, and the computer won. World chess champion Gary Kasparov abruptly resigned after the 19th move by the IBM computer known as Deep Blue. There is an incremental route involving just modest improvements that gets us to full human intelligence. That's the route that I think the robots can also follow. There's this feeling that we are failed people because we can't possibly keep up with the technology. And I think that's an issue that has to be spoken to. It's yeah. like speeding up and speeding up and like, I mean, where are we heading to in a way, you know? We can make blood vessels. We can make bone. We've done skin. And I've heard people say, well, there are all the components of making a limb. So I think really, for when we talk about digital flesh, we're not talking metaphorically, we're talking in fact of like a, a kind of android construct that is being created. trip you're only on when the camera's on and you're hyper you're on hyper right. but when you're off camera we can't even have a discussion anymore because that that part of Arthur Croker doesn't even exist anymore <laughs> it's just the video croaker that I know <laughs> speak to my video avatar <laughs> Look, now he's even wearing his sunglasses all the time <laughs> Tonight we have with us two prophets of the wired world. They are Canadians, they are world known. Their most recent book, Hacking the Future, a look, maybe not an altogether pleasant one, into the future. I think on a global basis, we are living in a genuine civilizational crisis because we have really a split reality. Because on the one hand, you have like, you know, the gleaming, antiseptic, techno-futurist and really accelerated electronic world, which seems to really be spinning out of everybody's control. But on the other hand, you have like detritus in the world, like surplus populations and surplus classes, and they don't seem to be reconciling one with the other, and they seem, in fact, to be spinning away from each other. The faster the tech, the slower the speed of thought. The more accelerated the culture, the slower the rate of social change. The quicker the digital decomposition, the slower the political reflection. The more apparent the external speed, the more real the internal slowness. When I visited California this time, I paid a lot of attention to young people and listen to like these really tortured stories of self-confessions of people who, you know, don't feel autism or being numbed and fractured as 
a kind of description of the culture outside themselves, but feel themselves like numbed and shut down and can't feel. You know, they really, for myself, are really like the digital pioneers in some ways, like a digital generation. And they feel the possibilities and the loss of opportunity in their own flesh and soul. Now, you know, the 90s are characterized by this absolute suffocation of the energies of the young, keeping down anything original and new from happening, and keeping everything in this kind of endless remake loop, mm -hmm. you know, in this endless kind of glorification of what's been done in the past. It's what Nietzsche said, you know, let the dead bury the living. I've had so many students recently who have told me that they've been throwing their televisions out their windows, smashing their computers, really because their idea of a digital future is, in fact, for them. It opens up a real peril of absolute disconnection, and they want to connect with life once more. So many younger people that we've met feel very isolated. They feel isolated. They feel hopeless, absolutely. And they talk about things like slow suicide, mm -hmm. slow riot. We were like in a cyber cafe like this one in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and we met this dancer, Denise. And she really interested us, you know, both for what she was saying, but also what she looked like. She stood up and she had these long red slits that ran up and down her arms. So we asked her about them. And she told us about the newest kind of phenomena in San Francisco these days, which is a thing called slash and burn. She would slash her um, arms and her legs um, with a razor blade, and then she would set it on fire. And I was just like horrified when I heard this. Why would you do that? And you said, it wasn't for the pain. What I wanted to do was feel again. Is it worth going through that? Well, what do people want to do that? To gain the sensation. Could you do that to yourself? What it indicates in many ways is extreme distress. Like when we talk about technology as flesh eating, this for us is what we're on the look for, is the kind of distress that technoculture causes people. She felt the culture was just too difficult to deal with. And I think that person is really a metaphor for Western civilization, because I think the whole culture has gone numb for self-protection because of information overload and data overload. Is that numbness that pervasive, though, do you think? Well, I think, I think it is, actually. But, but is that, really, is that numbness that pervasive? I think uh, more and more moving into the office, more and more like doing jobs involving um, virtual images and virtual experiences. People are experiencing things more and more virtually. And like what this offers is you can be in the presence of something that's really happening. You could get hit by a piece of flying metal. You feel the heat of the flamethrowers. You have to step back sometimes because it's too hot. And I think that as those kinds of experiences become more and more rare, there's gonna be more of a yearning and a craving for, for that kind of real thing to yeah. happen, you know? You just go to any of the cyber labs up and down Silicon Valley in California, and you can see that the old-time capitalists who wanna make a quick killing in cyberspace rule the roost. <laughs> And they've basically converted many of the computer specialists, particularly young people, into, you know, like micro serfs or into digital slaves. Well, it's not going to be a long time until the real knowledge center, you know, the really creative energies of digital reality, in various ways begins to rebuild against the real moneyed aspect of the virtual class.
BIT signals a concern for the safety of the corporate imagination and its designs on our technological futures. BIT reprotocols human machine interaction. We re engineer and reconstruct product. The Bureau of Inverse Technology is pleased to announce product 0023 Suicide Box. You know, the best voices of the United States today, you know, scream in agony because of their silencing at the hands and behest of a virtual class that does not want to hear any critiques of the fact that this wonderful technotopian vision of a knowledge-based economy is in fact creating surplus labor and surplus bodies and surplus imagination and surplus culture. And it's not outside of ourselves, but in fact is a deep kind of schizophrenic split that has come inside everybody's body. Well, I wondered if um, you had any other vision for the future. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, your analysis of where we are possibly heading is marvelous, but... <laughs> Preparing notes on the future here. Yeah. The miracle of the future. Oh, it's just the wonderful future we have. Remember to say that. Yes. All curves and plastic. Monsanto's House of the Future is open to the public at Disneyland. A family food center to store atomically irradiated food. A look at the future. Looks good, eh? What do you think, Arthur, we can glean from future gazing? For myself, what we can glean is perhaps a reflection on the idea of the future. Because I think today the concept of a future is itself entirely debatable. Because since the dropping of the atomic weapon on Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War, we have entered into a historical time in which we have conquered the notion of time itself and have certainly conquered the notion of history. Because very, for the first time, rather than history being this indeterminately opening prospect, you know, which is outside of human control, suddenly we control the end of time, the end of history. The choice of, you know, the lead Western society, the United States, the society of so-called civilization, really deciding to experiment with the dropping of atomic weapons mindlessly led by the, you know, really fascist sensibilities of Curtis LeMay and others, you know, the American military people, who just used the last year of the war for just population experiments and exterminism. Well, for myself, it's really been downhill since then because a big ethical divide was passed at that point, and society and cultures have been, since then, really open completely you know, like their technological circuits have been wide open and human beings have been turned into experimental subjects. Beware of those who distort providence under the guise of science. Under the guise of development, we find desolation of the human heart. Part of the language of technology today is a war language. And it's a war language intended to destroy human beings, and certainly to destroy consciousness. Just as in the 1950s, people in the United States were used and often used as unwitting sites for radiation and germ warfare experiments, in the 1990s, radical experiments are now underway in biotech labs to clone the DNA of the human body to mix species types and to create living, breathing laboratory organs. It sounds like science fiction. Man could someday. Scientists taking a cell from one living being. Now about two and a half weeks ago. Making an exact copy. The first successful. Now for the first time, researchers have. Captivated the attention. Cloned an adult mammal. Of the world. And remember, you can't stop science. Physicist Richard Seed has proposed to clone human beings for the very first time. 
the president of the United States is against this, religious leaders around the world are against this, governments around the world are against this. What would it take, do you think, to change people's minds about this process? Oh, that's very easy. Half a dozen healthy, happy, bouncing baby clones. I think when there's a half a dozen healthy, bouncing baby clones and they're shown on your television network, public opinion will change. The rule of society seems to be that which is technically feasible becomes technically and culturally necessary very quickly. They just hope the media and public soon get over their Frankenstein fantasies and understand what they're really doing here. Can you update us? I mean, we've heard a lot about cloning in the, in the news in the last couple of weeks, and people saying, OK, here we go, we're doing it. Yeah, cloning will happen because one of the historical tendencies of our society is like a friendliness to eugenic experiments. I mean, we've closed our eyes and we've done cloning and eugenic experiments for a long time to plant life, for example, and certainly to animal life, the basis of our food supplies, and now we're just going to do it to human life itself. I asked him to delay the time of his day to extend my day. This will to experiment and to vivisect human life, you know, to deracinate human life is just open-ended and unconscious of reflection on its possible consequences itself. And that's very nice, you know, for like a corporatist world, because there's a lot of powerful telecommunications companies and pharmaceutical companies take full advantage of the science's willingness to vivisect human beings and to vivisect life. And if you stand against that, if you refuse to bow to the rising sun of the technological dynamo, then in fact you're like, a, you're like an antique wind in some ways that's to be passed by. And that I think is a contemporary state of culture in the late 1990s, a so-called vaunted third millennium that approaches us. Today, tech reality like clonal engineering and genetic resequencing of DNA, copywriting the human species and tissue engineering accelerates beyond really all traditional theories of tech ethics. Tech has taken a big hit on the central nervous system, just like Marshall McLuhan warned us, but now bunker time for the self-protection of the human species is just finished. Now the future is flash forwarded into the present it's licking and it's probing and it's cloning and it's massaging the human species. Starting now with genetic surgery, having developed microchips which can develop themselves into the next generation, these are the glimpse of something totally different. And uh, we have to just to forget about all these human values and everything what comes from the past. And we don't understand what's going on, but something dramatic is going to happen. CEOs of all the multinational corporations like to say, adapt or you're toast. And we believe that today more than ever, we have to return to, in fact, a real form of ethical refusal before, in fact, we commit ourselves to the technologies. There's so much going on in every area, you know, culturally and politically and socially. And I think that in each aspect, you have to think critically, what does this really mean? You know, like political change in new realities always begins with the individuals who say no. There, there are no inevitabilities. This is a historically specific situation, you know, a conjuncture of forces. So that everything has to do, in fact, with rethinking through politics of resistance that's equal to the situation today. You know, like one of the decisive elements in rethinking a possible vision of resistance lies with artists. Artists tell us decades in advance of the damages and possibilities that are being done to us by technologies. So I would say like the real ethical responsibility for re-envisioning the future lies first and foremost with an artistic community itself. Because what is at stake today is what is going to be the language of perception, of aesthetic perception, by which in fact we rethink our reality. The 
this is not a nice piece, no. actually. No, it's and we not terrible. we do not intend to to make nice pieces. No, I understand. Um, but I believe as this is somehow also a portrait of a human being, you know, sort of distorted, um, let's say, very subjective portrait. And we know there comes a second part. And the second part just abandons all this emotional expression and, and it really turns into a machine. For myself, the dominating historical force at the end of the 20th century is what I would call, you know, the will to technology or the will to virtuality. And the will to virtuality is about the disappearance of the human species itself. It's about, in fact, creating a successor species to the human form. And many artists like Stellark and others, in fact, you know, are sensitive to this and they have come up with a really desperate strategy saying we have to re-engineer the human body, grow like photosynthetic flesh, grow kind of bubbling brains that have different forms of adaptation. We have to empty out the organ, the body of its kind of liquid organs and give ourselves dry organs because we have to find possibilities by which something called a successor to the human body can survive in an immensely speeded up and accelerated and stressed land of the technoscape itself. Perhaps that sort of question, whether it's human anymore, is not the right one to ask. For example, have we ever been human in the romantic Rousseau-esque way that we believe? I mean, has the body ever been this biological entity in a natural landscape? What has made us human has been the production of artefacts and instruments. In other words, for me, what's important is not reproducing the species through you know, male-female intercourse, but rather redesigning the body through human-machine interface. <laughs> now, most electronic artists are like this. They might have 20th century bodies, but they most certainly have 21st century hyperbolic minds. Electronic artists are involuntarily, and certainly for better and for worse, geographers of a new territory, living at the interstices of two species types, human and android, trying really desperately to pretend that everything is normal, that they're not the earliest star voyagers to a bodily planet that already exists deeply inside us even if their physical bodies are just too slow and will always be too slow to catch up. In terms of the information overload, the precise and powerful terrain of machines and the extraterrestrial space that we find ourselves accelerated into, the human body becomes profoundly obsolete. And this is not purely a personal problem of my own. Like, at what point do we stop being human? Do you see a point, or is it just that we have to constantly redefine what human is? Uh, no, it's a really interesting question. At what point do you stop being a human being? Well, maybe the point is we've never started being human beings. I mean, I think, like, the French thinkers Deleuze and Guattari got it just completely correct when they said that we are always, like, becoming human, becoming animal, becoming stone, becoming possibility, and that we really live as processes and movements where things migrate into one another. Why are we so violently opposed to the notion of becoming human as also becoming animal as Aboriginals understood? We're 
you know, they put on like the shark's mask or the dolphin's mask or the eagle mask. And then these wonderful descriptions where they say, I put on the mask and I am no longer myself. I am an eagle. I am a bear. I am a dolphin. They were really forms of mysticism. And those forms of mysticism are absolutely outlawed in technological culture. We are not allowed to be mystical and we are not allowed to be mythic and we are not allowed to be religious in any profound sense of the term. That for myself is like a really deeply crippling technological way of thinking about the question of being and self of human being. And it's killing us. There are people who have to say, look, there is a price to pay for this. You're making a mistake. Your enthusiasm is misplaced. Of course, if they listen to Arthur, they're going to really get depressed. And, and uh, who knows what's going to happen. But they have to hear this anyway, not only because he may be right, but because even if he's half right, technology and technological change are very serious business. <sighs> In the last uh, few years, uh, Honda Motors has demonstrated a rather astounding machine. It's a humanoid robot called P2. There is now a P3. P3 is smaller than P2. It walks faster. There are more of them being built, strictly for research purposes at the moment. It appears that uh, Honda is doing some long-term planning here. They're looking for another market that can use their skills, and they're betting on robotics. I think they're right in their bet. Mass-produced robots will become possible. There are dozens of robots around the world figuring out their way around corridors, around obstacles, recognizing people. Not quite reliably enough to be commercially viable, but soon they will be. It seems that the Carnegie Mellon Lab is the birthing place of America's most media-famous robots. Dante, last seen on global satellite TV, tipping over on its side while climbing out of a steaming, belching volcano. The Mars long-range planetary explorer, and robots also for scrubbing clean, toxic industrial waste. But really, the very best of all, an all-automated, gleaming artificial intelligence robotic car for worry-free driving on American freeways future. Now what's interesting about this robo-carrier is that it's already been thoroughly road tested, sent out one dark winter night on its maiden robo-voyage without any advance warning on a trip with no human passengers from Erie to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, about 200 miles through some of the prettiest and certainly slipperiest and most dangerous driving country in America. And all this without a stop, without an accident, and certainly without an auto eyebrow being raised by all the passing traffic. The marketplace will similarly steer the robots as natural selection steered us. What biological evolution, though, should tell us is that there is an incremental route involving just modest improvements, that's the route that I think the robots can also follow. We are dealing with ordinary machines here. These are highly complicated pieces of equipment, almost as complicated as living organisms. They've been designed by other computers. We don't know exactly how they work. Artificial intelligence, artificial vision, hybrid vision, use, uses artificial intelligence, use, uses hybrid vision, use, uses, use, uses, use, uses hybrid vision. When I was a university student in the late 1950s, computers were running at about 30,000 operations per second. And today, they're about a million times as fast as that rate. We're carrying out billions of operations per second, and it's far from finished. Today, computers don't look very impressive, and that's because today, computers are about as mentally competent as insects. But within that same model that says today they're like insects, it says that in 10 years, they'll be like 
lizards and in 10 more years they'll be like mice and 10 more years they'll be like monkeys and 10 years after that they'll be like people. When some of the early researchers first discussed how strongly computers might be programmed to play chess, it wasn't clear that you could ever build a machine that could be as good as the world's uh, best human. Nobody used the word world champion at that point. Man against machine has been a challenge since humans discovered how to make devices work for them. The latest chapter was when chess champion Garry Kasparov stared into the emotionless eye of Deep Blue, IBM's problem-solving computer. The difficult part about the machine is that it's um, fearless, it doesn't care about weather or noise in the hole. It just doesn't react to any normal factor that would uh, irritate your human, human opponent. And that's why my task would be to create positions where I could use the advantages of human intuition and the power of calculation is not completely dominant. With all the chess machines that Kasparov's played with before Deep Blue, he claims that he doesn't really see a mind in the machine. What he sees are, are gears and cogs and he's able to outsmart these machines by playing a few moves ahead of their search depth. When playing Deep Blue, uh, he got a shock. He looked for the machinery behind the moves, and what he saw instead was a mind. He actually reported that. <laughs> and whoa! Deep Blue, Kasparov, after the move C4, has resigned. A six-game chess match pitting brains against circuitry is over, and the computer won. Later at a news conference, Kasparov lashed out at IBM for programming the computer specifically to beat him. For challenging the artificial intelligence of IBM, Kasparov has hunted down strategically, he's broken psychologically, he's defeated artificially, and he's humiliated symbolically. I have to apologize again. I'm ashamed by what I did at the end of this match. But so be it. I feel confident that the machine hasn't proved anything yet. As machines become more powerful, we're going to see these mind-like behaviors in more and more mundane areas. Eventually, we'll have this Kasparov effect, but for every man. <laughs> In the days following Kasparov's defeat, IBM stock soared to record heights. And at IBM's victory party over the human species, one company exec revealed the hidden secret of the game, and I quote, the information age has finally begun. surveillance center and um, what this center does is that we do the surveillance of the entire Bell Canada network there. The way that we used to do the surveillance of the network before is that we had so many people and they were working in practically all the sites but as technology evolved the uh, equipment became more and more sophisticated and now it's software driven and does not need the attention that it used to get. So we're talking about 6,000 sites that we would look at from here. You can and check 6,000 sites? Yes. We would be able to know does the site have electricity? Is the front door open? This center does everything. But has this resulted in a lot of, like, a lot of job losses and stuff? Well, well there, there have been, a lot of companies have been in downsizing it, and certainly Bell has been downsizing. Basically, what we're replacing is a lot of people that work elsewhere, that yeah. no longer work elsewhere. So we decreased a lot in number of technicians, but the people uh, are working here instead. triumph of technology and the surfacing of a new ruling global class, what I would call the virtual class, and the simultaneous appearance of a surplus class. Surplus bodies and surplus labor, surplus imagination and surplus culture. They sweep these streets here in this town because nobody had to give them the time of day. These are people intelligent, man, who are, you know, not stupid, you know. And to play these people for stupid and, and to write them off, it's frightening. 
generation of people they've written off in this country, frightening. Just think of like where I'm standing right now. I'm standing on the dock of the bay. Right behind me are some rotting wharfs. But if you just look out in the bay a little bit, you see these beautiful yachts sort of cruising by and beautiful sailing ships cruising by. And the whole city's like that. You have homeless people who have migrated from the, across the United States and from across California, don't have jobs, and they're living in school buses and trailers, and they're, they're not dumb, you know, they're really smart. They have real, genuine survival skills to be able to eke out a living on the edge of the city. And then if you just swivel your eyes and look downtown, you see the Transamerica building, this huge Masonic architectural symbol of power that when I last looked had assets of $38 billion. So on one hand, you have unparalleled economic might, and on the other hand, you have people who are dispossessed, not only of their flesh, but dispossessed of a means of living, real surplus flesh. They could be living or dead because the technological class could really care less. Technology is there for all of us to use to make a better society. I mean, I really think it can do that, and that's what it should be doing. It shouldn't be sort of spinning out of control. The machinery, the mechanisms of the post-industrial economy have taken on almost a life of their own, and they have become a perpetual motion machine. This is epitomized best by the global investment markets that go 24 hours with Tokyo spinning off to London, spinning off to New York, and stock trades going on at the speed of nanoseconds. There's this feeling that we are failed people because we can't possibly keep up with the technology. And I think that's an issue that has to be spoken to. I mean, technology is not saying we have to go faster and faster. People that control the technology are saying that. It's going to be on a 24-hour basis, things are going to be happening. Night and day, there'll be no difference. Our phone works 24 hours a day. Now there's television 24 hours a day. Well, everything will be happening 24 hours a day. What we're dealing with is an extension of the industrial economy into a cybernetic phase. And this is where the doing and the management of things is being transformed from a material base to the immaterial form of software, data, and electronic information. The next generation would be automatic monitoring of the monitors. I don't want to be replaced. <laughs> That's technology. Ultimately, we have fully automatic companies where management, manufacturer, marketing, research and development, and everything else is executed by machines. The robot corporations I'm talking about will evolve from the corporations as we know them today. There might be an entity called IBM, which is just a giant machine. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the fear of machines taking over the world, the point at which I start becoming a machine. It's not only a fear, but at the end of this millennium, in fact, people's identities are just being shattered wide apart. Human culture has just been pulverized by technology. People live like in 24-hour media spans all the time, but consciousness hasn't caught up to that yet, and perception certainly hasn't. There's a very good French writer called Paul Virilio. We live in what he calls an eyeball culture. And the machinery of perception comes from the outside and really tries to capture our attention and substitute its perception for our own. It's almost as if human vision has been shut down and machine vision has been opened up. Mainframe computers keep our water going, keep the electricity going, keep the planes in the air. Everything exists on this level of technology. So it's a matter of survival on the one hand, and it's also a matter of freedom. Because in the contemporary world, we really linked our identity to an expanding technology as the fullest measure possible of human freedom. Technology is our deepest form of identity. It's not outside of ourselves, but in fact, it is us.
Why don't you wish to say anything now? No, I, I, I'm not going to argue. It's not time to argue. Uh, Mark, I'm Arthur Croker. It's uh, good to see you. Right now, we're in the, wow, isn't that exciting, phase of computing. And if you listen to Bill Gates and Andy Grove talk about the future of computing, they will say it's going to be more exciting, more multimedia, more video. That isn't what excites me. I don't want more television on my PC screen. I want the computer to get out of the way so that we get smarter and better able to do things. And the computers, thousands of them for each of us, are serving us in our environment and being worn in our clothing and so forth. Computers in stores and in watches and in our refrigerators, little ones stuck on walls, arranged around on the desk, opening up us to more freedoms, more information, and hopefully a better life. During two recent visits to Xerox Park in Palo Alto, California, I discovered that the Xerox of the virtual future is really not interested any longer in copying paper, but actually wants to copy bodies into cyberspace and into machines. If paper goes away, we're ready. If computers end up being embedded inside everyone's head, we're ready. One of the technologies we've looked at is this technology for sort of tracking people around, which is basically a technology that lets you locate people in the building using a, a device they carry around. This is one of the things we use. This is a, a, a keychain sized version I carry on a keychain. And then really I got it that Xerox has taken the concept of the electronic cuff that's worn by stay at home prisoners and transformed it into the central principle of electronic office design for the 21st century. A tab dog for every worker, a bird dog for every bureaucratic corporate complex. That's Xerox of the future. We have a camera set up near the stadium. He's under surveillance now. I think the level of dispossession and the level of lack of respect for your own privacy and really profound miscomprehension of the real ways in which power operates in our culture, in which democracy is just really an Alice in Wonderland, in which there is an illusion of democracy, an illusion of protection of civil liberties. But the instant that your sort of eye gets shifted away, and what immediately appears is this kind of soft fascism or wet fascism. We need some form of identification. Management wants it. We just had a little pad of paper and we were just taking notes and the security guard came over and asked us what we were doing with this piece of paper and what we were writing. critical on this technological development. Now, uh, is this, could this be called pessimism or stark vision, or is it just reality? I mean, realism from, from your point of view. The only way to think realistically today is to think radically pessimistically. It's in fact to think in a clear-eyed way of the price that's paid by human flesh for the coming to be of a technological civilization. 
and now the crisis is even more acute because we are confronted with not only the end of our culture, but with the end of the human body itself. The skin is a living organ, and Aplograph is the first commercialized human skin equivalent. This marks the introduction of, if you like, tissue engineering. For too long, skins had it too easy. Like an evolutionary hanger-on from an earlier age, skin's just gone along for the ride, big, fat, and lazy, an epidermal slacker before its time. Now, in digital reality, all that's about to change. Now is a time of intelligent, distributive cyber skin that abandons its loyalty to local bodies and goes fully electronic, sort of tech flesh for the 21st century. You're making in a laboratory setting a replacement for a tissue that is active, uh, interactive, and performs the function of, of, of the tissue or organ uh, that it's replacing immediately, and then over time gets better. The skin was the easiest organ to synthesize. There are now in development some more complex organs that rely very much on 3D technologies. Hearts, kidneys, bone, cartilage, these are all organs that are currently being evaluated. The cultural implications of the internet pale in comparison to tissue engineering. Designers of a new species type, eugenic scientists are the agents by which recombinant organs will be created. We can make blood vessels, we can make bone, you can probably go in and culture muscle cells. We've done skin. And I've heard people say, well, there are all the components of making a limb. There's been a real shutdown of attention and consciousness about the materiality of the human body and of human flesh and the vicissitudes of human life. Everybody accepts it. It, says it comes to us in the language of seduction. And we call the whole thing, you know, freedom and you know, the, the development of a perfect technological society. But there's no broadly based ethical discussion. And I feel my task for myself and Mary Louise as well is at least to raise questions and ethical concerns to in fact raise a public debate, which the biotech industry and the biogenetics industry desperately wants to avoid. There really are not uh, medical ethical questions that are very different than, uh, you know, the current practice of medicine. Um, I. I I, I, I'm, I'm really not uh, uh, tuned into those. Okay. What used to be simply money divisions between the rich and the poor are going to be a new kind of eugenic division between those who are body part rich versus those who are body part poor. Our technological future is in a test tube. Cloning, mixing cow and human cells, copywriting of the human DNA, the manipulation of the genetic code, artificial chromosomes. What are the ethical implications for biotech research when that research reaches into human life and changes that life? I just had this feeling that like all of culture, human culture today, is already something that's been cut off. Human bodies are sort of lying around as like an extra surplus product in some ways, like surplus matter. And a substitute species is literally being grown and cloned in experimental bats. We, in fact, are growing our own millions in some ways. We assemble your body as a sheep. We assemble your body as a sheep.
machine. You want to use chemicals to turn me into a humanoid like those other kids? Ah! Reassemble your body. I've got the power! A giant step after a man's evolution. In some cases, they've been designed by other computers. There are many ways to order that data. We've got the power, we've got the will, we'll get the money, we've got the power to... Reassemble your body as a machine. Data. Reassemble your body. Order that data. Complicated data. Ordinary data. Living. We've almost always imagined that the notion of the cyborg would be this kind of traumatic event in our human history. We'd be ripping out organs and, and pushing in clunky parts and, and, and gear wheels and pistons and, you know, this very, very sort of mechanistic view of, of redesigning the body. But imagine a colony of micro-miniaturised designer robots that could actually redesign the body, manipulate the very DNA coding, restructure the matter configuration in our bodies, atoms up, inside out. You wouldn't even know what was going on until finally the transformation would surface to the skin level. <laughs> Ultimately, we will be able to do nano surgery on genes and create designer genes so that you can make a child from a series of menu items, you know, one from column A and one from column B. At labs from Zurich to Montreal, nanotechnologists are not only implanting technologies within the body, they're also developing the tools to manipulate the body's very atomic structure. For myself, like the field of nanotechnology has really been filled with a lot of pretty scary kind of speculation. Possibilities for the pharmaceutical companies, for mm -hmm. sure, genetic manipulation at a molecular mm -hmm. level, uh, surveillance technologies. And I can't see how that would be prevented, actually. Because mm -hmm. I don't think this corporatist network will allow into itself any ethical reflection. The fact that the potential is there does not mean that we have to act on it. It's a problem of will and law. Society is starting to discuss or not accept some of the genetic engineering. People are becoming more aware and want to have more to say about where are the actual limits. I have a lot of power as a consumer. If I decide I don't like that, I don't buy it. That corporations understand immediately. That's not a real argument. They've never let consumption be like something passive. There's a lot of preparation of audience reception. And no one's going to put long-term investments into nanotechnology without making sure, in fact, that consumers are prepped for it in advance, sure. usually through an ideology of facilitation. Like, yeah. I could use some of these nano bones myself right yeah. now with my yeah. aching back, <laughs> and you're going to have some good nano blood, and you're going to have little chips circulating through your yeah. body. And it's good for yourself, good for yeah. your children, and who's going to be against life? The new forms of scientific experimentation with the body always speak in terms of life itself and who's going to refuse life or who's going to refuse greater knowledge and things. There are many unsuspecting, silent things happening to our bodies as the digital reality secretes its way into our veins and into our flesh that we haven't brought to the level of consciousness or articulation yet. Everything is very, very gradual. It's gradual so you don't even know the changes happening, just like the changes with technology. That all of a sudden a lot of things are acceptable. Cloning or changing people's DNA, incremental changes. For us at the end of the 20th century, we don't even live in a technological society anymore. We live in a society which is dominated by what we call the world of virtuality. And the world of virtuality means the extraction of the energy and of the life form out of the human species and the potential replacement of the human species by impacting the android life form itself. I think of these things as our offspring. They're, they're mind children. They're they're things that uh, initially think like us, have our values, have our welfare at heart. 
later they'll grow into something else and, and, and pursue their own goals. But as children, I think they're the best children we could have. Uh, they have by far the greatest future. So I think we should just throw our weight behind it and give them the best send-off that we can, give them the best preparation for life that we can, and then have the best hopes for them because they're, they're going to inherit the universe and be able to do things that we can't even imagine. everything work as we planned it? The future is not a straight line. It is filled with many crossroads. There must be a future that we can choose for ourselves. All this led to a no time time and a no place place. All this led to a no time time and a no place place. You might like to think that these technologies are on the outside and that you still have a choice. But in fact, you don't have a choice because these technologies have become really invisible and have come inside the body itself. That's the whole migration of technologies. It takes possession of the body, it takes possession of the mind. We're living in a society really of body possession by the technology for good and for bad. But as human beings, we already resist that. I mean, what we find with all of the access that we already have to the internet and the ability to adopt new and different personalities and have cyber sex, whatever you want. I mean, when it comes right down to it, we all want to be held and touched by other human beings. We're still sort of fighting for that. I think that's true, because... Yeah, I think that's true. I, I hope that's true. Yeah, for this? I don't know, Arthur likes to talk about dumping his body all the time, and I say, no, 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 don't do it. I like it, I want it. No, she'll say, come back, come please, back. Please. <laughs> well, no, but it is true, but you can have both at the same time. Because you can have real desires for intimacy and face-to-face -face contact and real human communities. But at the same time, you can live with a real sense of emancipation and intimacy really in cyberspace, in the electronic world itself. All right, I understand that and I accept that, but when you get into bed with your husband at night, that is a different kind of intimacy. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I don't as easily say that the experiences that you have in the technological domain are any less vivacious or passionate as experiences we have face to face. I have any number of students who have had love experiences and sexual experiences, which for them are much more intense, I think, than real physical experiences. Because a lot of people today live in these different bodies. People live in virtual experience and live in a physical experience or organic experience. And sometimes the two come together and sometimes they don't. And something like the internet relations or web sex or virtual sex are all new forms of reality that are you know, giving a materialization to what's come to be known as the virtual body. We better get used to it and figure out what's going on. Everyone lives in virtual experience, like television experience, virtual experience. Because the global economy now is a matter of vectors and virtualities. There really are well-traveled touristic vectors from London to Tokyo to New York. 
And one of the real nodal points, almost like in a computer grid in some ways, is a city like Vienna. It just this vector node. Just take those. Oh, what, we're in, what? I thought we were in New Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> roll, roll that film again. <laughs> <laughs> In this future world, there can be many, many, many of you. Uh, you can have different experiences at the same time in different versions of yourself and then merge those experiences. It's really not that different from having different experiences at different times and remembering them all. It's just that now you have to remember this was, this was copy 6007 and that was copy 2003. <laughs> One very interesting field may be the development of a personal digital ego. My personal electronic identity in the net or in the computer environment. I really mean a digital parallel world where some of my digital selves are living. They have their own memory, they have their own experiences. And so this is not only computer programs doing assistant work, this is electronic identities of me. The ultimate aim of the virtual class is to download the human body into cyber vats of data to virtualize human flesh. I've been told by more than one middle-aged computer specialist that they just wish they could mind merge with the digital world or at least dump their body into the virtual data stream. So are you suggesting that cyberspace is sort of substitute for uh what religion used to be, or the, the kind of profane religion. I mean, the metaphysics of cyberspace are Christianity completely. At least the language, the power languages by which cyberspace is described, is in fact the completion of the Christian myth. The Christian myth, after all, if you go back to like St. Augustine, was always about escaping the vicissitudes of the flesh. St. Augustine liked to say, I'll ride the nag of the flesh on the road to Jerusalem. Well, cyberspace engineers that we've talked to are riding their own nag of the flesh and really want to dump their flesh inside the machine itself. St. Augustine often talked about the necessity of escaping the prison house of the body. In other words, that the way to salvation would be through the suppression of human experience itself. For example, if you think of the history of the Inquisition, you know, for hundreds of years it's filled with profound forms of cruelty that are inflicted on the human body itself. Like actually taking red hot pincers and tearing the flesh off human beings, gouging eyeballs out, stretching the human bodies to where actually flesh breaks in two. But for myself, what's important about that experience besides the history of suffering and cruelty, is that this was not done by the priests and bishops of the Inquisition with a sense of bad conscience or with any sense of guilt whatsoever. Quite the contrary, they believed that in fact the way of liberating the body of the sinful was finally through inflicting pain on the body to liberate themselves from flesh itself. When I turn to the history of technology, to this point of course you don't have the same histories of cruelty, but you have a much more globalized experience with exactly the same attitude but it's stripped of the beatific belief which Christians had that in fact there was a division between an afterworld and the contemporary experience itself. This is a much more reduced, secularized, banal version of Christianity, but it's inf infected by the same degree of hatred towards human experience and same profound forms of contempt for you know, real material existence, for the vicissitudes of human experience. and a burning desire to reconfigure, rewire the razor-sharp angel of desire. You've got a Hollywood face. You've got a Hollywood face. No more wrinkled skin and a sagging chin, bloodshot eyes and a body to despise. You've got silicone lips and cutting-edge hips, diamond eyes seeing silver skies. You've got a Hollywood face. You've got a Hollywood face. No one's taken your place. You've got a Hollywood face. Even if we can augment ourselves, we still basically have this, this in, in, intrinsic Stone Age psyche. 
I don't think that even with the transference of a mind into artificial forms and, and tinkering with it afterwards, we have any hope of keeping up with robots and with robot evolution. We can tweak ourselves, change things. We can make ourselves faster. We can maybe remove some of the sensory programming and replace it with something more direct. Ultimately, we'll change everything. And we still will be second rate. The trouble is we're bringing along too much baggage. So, so just get rid of it. <laughs> We really just want to dump the human body. Yes, I think our bodies are obsolete. They believe that we can't catch up to robotic intelligence. We would be left behind. The race is over. I think we're goners. I mean, it's, it's not that we've been human beings all that long, actually. It's, it's only been a million years or so. That evinces such a form of mindlessness and like carelessness about the you know, the legacy and traditions of human life itself, and at the same time, is so puerile that it can only make me think that of those technocrats that speak this way, that their own conception of experience must be absolutely arid and reduced to like a, a level of profound nihilism that's almost beyond imagination itself. And having said that, though, I'm very mindful that it's precisely out of such a hollowed out conception of human life become the most dangerous vision. and then they must have joined these a little further near the gas station. That should also be still there. I mean, what we saw in Frankfurt was really, really disturbing because we saw the genealogy of fascism, the actual place where Cyclone B, the gas used in the exterminism camps during the Holocaust, was manufactured. The complex over here was what was formerly known as Degech, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Schädlingsbekämpfung, which translates into English as the uh, German company for the extermination of vermin. They started out with uh, chemicals dealing with cockroaches, rats, and moved later on into producing Cyclone B. We can see here the remaining traces of the tracks that used to transport the chemicals to where the concentration camps were located. They were not located on German soil. The Jews of Frankfurt were collected at a place further down near the old vegetable market. And the railway tracks join a little further down. So you would have on one track coming the boxcars with chemicals. And on the other track, the boxcars packed with people. So for myself, you know, that is like a cruel, massively sad, and you know, stuns you into silence reflection on fascism. But that form of fascism today is, I believe, retro-fascism, and still speaks in Rwanda, and it speaks in Bosnia for sure. But the new potential form of fascism is not that kind of fascism anymore. It's virtual fascism or technological fascism if left to its own devices. Because what it wants now are not just parts of the human species. It doesn't want to just do experiments on homosexuals and Jews and political opponents. It wants to do an experiment on the whole human species itself. Where möchten Sie hin? 
I don't understand. Uh, where did you want to go? I want to go uh, to Munich. To Munich? Yeah. Oh, just try to go to uh, Münster. What do I have to change? Yes. Right to Münster. No. Oh, we gotta get off the uh, train. We're going the wrong way. Bei diesem Angebot haben Sie die Möglichkeit, sich zu einem Festpreis mit einem Taxifahrbahnhof bis vor die Haustür bringen zu lassen. Oder der Taxifahrer holt Sie vor der Haustür. Eventually, and I think it will happen within 30 or 40 years, we will be in a position where the world could continue to run without us. If we were to disappear overnight, human civilization would continue. Uh, it, uh, everything would be automatic, and not just automatic, but smart. It would not continue in some blind way like an automaton, it would evolve. It would continue to get better and better and better and expand and probably go better without us than with us. read the newspapers about the exterminism of species after species. Like the cod disappears. And there's no question of maybe we're following like general subtle practices, not just the cod, but also the fisheries, Aboriginal peoples in the society. The disappearance of forests and the disappearance of languages. These were already early warning systems of the disappearance of humanity and of human beings themselves. Why do we think we're exempt from these laws of technology? They're already thinking not simply of artificial intelligence, but really of artificial life, of successor species to human beings. And this is an inevitable development of the cultural logic of the technology to which we have committed. Because that technology is a technology of disappearances. conclusions that he can, but ask you all to bear in mind that we have all been trying to do the impossible this afternoon, namely forecast the future. Thank you. How about the visuals? <laughs> 